God called the expanse sky. So that's, you know, just, again, uh, a possibility what it may look like. But the point is, there's already life. And then now the earth is separated. The waters are separated, waters from waters. And so the question, obviously, the next question is, what is this water? And, and I'm sorry to tell you that I don't have the answer, okay? We don't know. I mean, especially the waters in the heaven. I mean, uh, the waters on the earth make sense, if it, but we don't know if it's salt water or is it or is it, uh, uh, you know, normal water that we drink today? We don't know. But we know that uh, there's water in the air, right? There's humidity and stuff like that. But in space, I don't know. And so there's different views. And I want to share with you a couple of views and just uh, highlight to you this just uh, how amazing God is. Uh, one view is that what we call, and this is something that I believe since college days because it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, we, I just call it or we call it the canopy of water. So the water is a separate. The earth is still water, okay? It's a blob of water. But the, the one in the heaven, the one that's separated from uh, the top, becomes um, uh, uh, a, a, diff a canopy of water. So I need two hands, so I'm going to talk like this. <laughs> so let's pretend that this earth has a small canopy. We need to get that mic working one day. So um, you can see the, the blue represent water, okay, and then there's the earth, the water beneath, that's what the Bible tells us. Also, there's that canopy of water around the earth. And so um, what this does is that it can create this uh, incredible protection for us. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, we say that this protection from the, U, uh, the UV radiation, the bad radiation that, that, uh, that kills people, that give us cancer and so on. And so... Um, I just want to read to you what this uh, uh, canopy, uh, people who believe in this, what they believe it does to the, to the earth. Listen to this. This is great. <coughs> they said that with uniform temperatures, great air mass movement would be inhibited. Wind storms would be unknown. With no global air circulation, the hydrological cycle of the present world would not be implemented. There could be no rain except direct over the bodies of water from which it might have re evaporate. With no global air circulation, because it's all protected by this canopy, there would be no turbulence, no dust particles transported in the upper atmosphere. The water vapor in the canopy would have been stable and not precipitate itself. Further, the planet would have been maintained not only at uniform temperature, but the comfortable uniform humidities by means of daily local evaporation and condensation, like dew or ground fog. The combination further of warm temperature, adequate mo moisture everywhere would be con conducive to extensive st uh, stands of lush vegetation over the world. No barren desert, no ice caps. A vapor canopy would be effective in filtering all the ultraviolet radiation, cosmic rays, and other destructive energies, and it goes on and on. So it's amazing. This canopy is really protecting the earth. And that is why if you look at Genesis in the very beginning, people live a long, long, long time. You know, I'll give you an example here. Adam, he lives 930 years, okay, in chapter 5, verse 5. And then you look in uh, uh, his son, Seth, lived uh, 912 years before he died, verse 8. Another one here, you see, so all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. Uh, at verse 11, and it goes on and on. People were living way in hundreds and hundreds of years, not like us today. 
right? Imagine that you're living. How many of you want to live 900 years? I personally don't, okay? But, uh, but they did back then. And, okay, so I, I, it's, it's time for a giveaway here. I have some T-shirt here, our, 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 our Cross City T-shirt, okay, Cross City International. So um, I have a question, and whoever can answer the question can have one of these T-shirts. Okay, I have three of them here, uh, extra large, large, and medium. If you need more than extra large, then I'm sorry. Um, you may have to pray and fast for 40 days, okay? So, um, so here's the question. Okay, and you guys help me. Whoever stands up first uh, will get to answer it. Okay, don't, don't shout it out. Just stand up, and I'll pick you. Okay, so here's the question, and if you can answer it, you'll get the T-shirt. Okay, here's the question is, who was the oldest man recorded in the Bible? What's his name, and how old was he? Okay, I think I saw you first, right? Okay, you want to hear that? Wow, that's amazing. All right, great job, great job. Thank you, thank you. Come on over, Juanita. Which, which one do you want? You want medium? Medium, okay, medium. All right, there's, there's a medium. All right, here you go. Congratulations. I have a couple more, so um, you're very welcome. I, I don't want to go home with this, okay? So, um, but hopefully, okay, how about, um, what question do I ask? Okay, what is the shortest verse in the Bible? Stand up. Stand up, I said, okay. Okay? Oh, sorry, no, okay, stand up first, but go ahead. I'm sorry? That's right. All right, okay. But I only have a large one, okay? Oh, no, sorry, I have an extra large. You want an extra large? Okay. But you know what? I feel bad for you, Ekla. You can have the small one. How's that? All right, there you go. All right, you guys can exchange if you want, but uh, <laughs> okay. So um, back to the word of God. So um, the canopy uh, views is that right during the flood, okay, that God broke that canopy, and so it rained for forty days, forty nights, if you remember, and the earth was filled with water. It completely killed everyone except those in the ark, okay. And it's interesting, if you look at the scriptures, that right after the flood, people's lives suddenly began to shorten. And here's a good picture of, of, of a graph, uh, what happened. You know, all in Genesis, in the beginning, up to Noah's time, people were living up to 969 years. But as soon as the flood, boom, it goes down to Abraham 175, and it went downhill from there on. And again, the view is that, of course, with the canopy gone, all this ultraviolet light, all this radiation comes, and it kills us if we don't live as long. And it's interesting there, it says the years of our life are 70 or even by reason 80 years, according to Psalm 90. And I looked it up in the, the global meter, or the world meters, that the average life expectancy in the world, average, not in America, but in average, the whole world, is 73.2 years. 73.2 years for male and female. Isn't that amazing? The Bible it says it right there that we're going to live an average 70 to 80 years. The Bible is always right, okay? And so, uh, and so this is a good explanation of, about the canopy of water that I happen to choose to, to believe in because it makes a lot of sense. However, there are many Christians, uh, scientists as well, who do not believe in the canopy uh, uh, theory. And this is what they said. So um, it says that uh, the heat problem, a large vapor or, or ice canopy would so increase heat that it would roast all living things if you have no movement of air and so you just have this heat. The light problem, they suggest, starlight, which God said would be for signs and seasons, could scarcely have been seen and sunlight could not have reached through with sufficient heat to support tropical plants. The pressure problem, a vapor canopy holding more than 40 feet of water would increase such high pressure at its base that its temperature would exceed 220 degrees Fahrenheit. To support problems, neither vapor, liquid, nor ice canopy could have uh, physically survived for many centuries between creation and the flood. It could condense, evaporate, or vaporize. It, could just, it wouldn't just stay there. And then the ultraviolet light problem, a canopy surrounding the atmosphere would not have been protected from the ultraviolet light, which would have dissociated water into hydrogen and oxygen, thus imme immediately destroying the canopy, and so on and so on. So, 
The bottom line, church, we don't just don't know what that water is. But God's word is real. He cut the waters from the water. There's an expanse. There's a space. But here's what I want you to grab, church, is that as you begin to see the creation story, we begin to see how God is preparing the earth to be a place for us to live. It's almost like a first-time parent. You're preparing a room for your, fir- for your children, for your first child to come. Right, you you prepare that room with a beautiful carpet. You have a wallpaper. You will have you know the the lighting. The make sure there's enough heat or cool enough. There's a window. There is a a, a a crib and all the other stuff that is needed for a child for your firstborn child. Just like a parent's getting excited, preparing the 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 room for that ch- for for their children for their child. The same thing I can see here how God amazingly preparing the earth to be a habitable uh, a place where we can live. That's what I want you to see. But I ask also for the Lord for an application. What is the application we can learn from, from this story, from this uh, verses of, about, about God separating the water from the waters? Just like last week, I made the application about God's, the power of God's word. Remember? The God's, how did God create light? He said he spoke it into being. Let there be light, and there was light. And I, I did the application that we don't have the power, same power with God in our words, but we do have a lot of power of our words. And I said that our words have the power to, to for life or death. Our words have the power to bless or to curse. Our words have the, bl- the power to, to, to tell the truth or to tell lies. But here, when I ask for God for an application for how he separates from the water from the water, immediately what comes to my mind is about how God is a God that separates we see this in, in, in the verse, first day. God saw the light was good and God separated light from darkness. And then today we learn that God separated the waters from the waters. And next week we will learn how God will separate the earth, like the, 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 the land, from the water, from the oceans. So the first three days God was constantly separating light from dark, waters from waters, and water from ground, dry ground. And so that tells me that God is a God that separates as well. And this is something we need to learn. This is very, very important for us. You see this throughout the scriptures, how God separated people. Noah, he separated from the rest of the, the world. Look what happened what in, in Noah uh, in chapter 6. Then the, world, uh, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of, throughout his life, of his heart was only evil, continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man from whom I've created, from the face of the land, from the man, from animals and creeping things, to the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But, verse 8, it says here that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So he separated Noah from the rest of humanity. He separated good from evil. Wherever Noah was, he saw favor, he found favor. And I preached that message one, but there's another sermon. He separated people, not only Noah, he separated his own people, Israel, right? I mean, look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. He says, for you are holy. The word holy means separate. So you can say, you can read it this way. For you are a separated people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So this is the first two is a physical separation here. Noah from the rest, Israel from the rest. And here's another one in the New Testament. He even separate families. Okay, look at Matthew. This is what, how Jesus said it. Do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but what? A sword right there. What does a sword do? It cuts. It separates. And he can hit it, verse 35. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother, her mother and a daughter-in-law with her mother-in-law and so on. It means that there's a time where we have to separate ourselves. It means there's a time when a family, when a, maybe the, one of the spouse, or maybe the children or the whatever accept Christ, but the rest does not, and they begin to be rejected. There'll be a time of separation. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to accept it, but that's what it says. I mean, it happens to Mimi when she became a Christian. Her mom, who was a strong Buddhist, you know, they lost their relationship for a couple of years. I remember from my own life. I, mean, I shared this to you before. I think that, you know, I have a cousin who's very close like my brother because his father is my dad's brother and his mom is my mom's sister's. 
So it's like two brothers and two sisters got married. So we were very close because he has no brother. I have no brother. We both have only one sister. So we, uh, during high school, he's only a year apart from me. We, and during high school, we always hang out together. We're like brothers until when I was 20, I accepted Jesus. I was born again. And suddenly there was a cut. He was an atheist. We didn't get along. We argue all the time. And pretty soon we just walked away. He goes his way. I go my way. It cuts us. So I know. I experienced it. Even though I led his wife to Christ, I led his, his father to the Lord. But for, so, for decades, we didn't talk, really talk. Not that we hate each other, but we just don't get along. It was only the last few years we started to communicate again. And so this is so, so true that even families will be separate because of the gospel. Because God does separate. But look at the next one, next few. He goes into a parable now. He began the parable of the tares, for instance, and the wheat. In Matthew 13, he says this way, Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. And so the, the servant went to the man and said, Hey, do, we want, do you want us to, to pluck out the tares from the wheat? And, the, man, and the, 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 the master said, No, no, don't do that. Because when you pluck out the tares from the wheat, you might pluck both of them. So leave them alone until the very end. And this is what it says in the very end. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them into the bundles and burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. So the tares was represent evil people, unrighteous, ungodly people. They will be separated from the wheat. The tares will be burned, hell, and the wheat will be put in heaven into his barn. Very clear, church, that God is a God that separates. Number five, another, uh, another um, a parable, he says it's between uh, he separated the disqualified wedding guests. He said again in this parable, he said Jesus spoke to them again. In, in parables, saying the kingdom of heaven, there it is again, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So in heaven, we're going to have a wedding feast, right? Jesus is the son, the bridegroom, and then uh, the church is the bride. And so when you read this, the parable, the king tells the servant, Quick, go to everywhere and invite people to the wedding. And then he invited, some people don't want to come, that's totally okay, but then the king said, I want you to go to everybody, even including the, the poor, you know, the handicapped, whatever. You just invite everyone and everybody who comes, who wants to come, can come. And that's obviously a clear story. Salvation is for all people. You're invited. But you just have to be willing to say, yes, I want to come. But when many people reject that. That's what the parable talks about. But look at the very happen in the end during the, during the, the, the party, uh, the wedding party. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man that was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Okay, so he couldn't answer. Oh, yeah, when, when we go before God, he said, how come you did not accept Jesus into your life? Oh, he can't explain. Well, I don't understand or what is in that. You cannot give any ex ex uh, uh, excuses. And this is what the king said. <coughs> the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. So I want you to see very clearly that the, the disqualified guest is because he did not have the robe of righteousness. He did not wear the right garment. And the garment represents the robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ because we, we cannot have righteousness of our own. We put on the righteousness of Christ upon us. And this is what happened. He separates Here's another one that I got excited because uh, I wish I can live through it, and that is the, 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 the rapture. The rapture, right? You probably heard about it. They make movies out of it, left behind, right? And so one day you'll be here, one day suddenly you're gone. And when you think about it, it's pretty cool. I thought it was a pretty, pretty neat, you know? But, it's, he's, but that's what, what's going to happen, right? Well, I mean, one day you're sleeping, and then you wake up, and your spouse is gone. One day you're driving and suddenly your passenger is gone or, or you're gone, you know, and then that would be terrible. But, uh, you know, for the passenger. Um, that's why I heard that uh, some airlines, they did not want to put two Christians as pilots. 
because if both pilots were raptured, then the passengers, <laughs> then the plane have no pilots, right? And I don't know if it's true or not. That's what I heard. But this is what the text tells us. What Jesus, this is actually Jesus talking. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the, the Son, but the Father's alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Now, what nobody knows, it's just going to happen suddenly. And this is what Jesus said. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be, will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and one will be left. God will separate. He constantly separates. And like I said, it's going to be kind of scary if you get left behind, right? If you are, you wake up and suddenly your spouse beside you that you've been sleeping with together for the last 20, 30, 40 years. But you've been playing church. He or she's been fully following the Lord. But he or she's been telling you about Jesus. But you just refuse. I just want to, I need to make more money. I need to more make money. But you're not serving the Lord. You're not loving him. And you wake up one day, suddenly your wife is gone. It'd be too late in the sense that you missed the rapture. I mean, you still can come to Christ, but you have to be going through the tribulation. So just to be clear, I mean, uh, this is for Kwang. I don't know if Kwang is here, but, you know, imagine if Kwang is the trainer there and he got raptured. I don't know. I'm so sorry for the guy <laughs> in the bottom there, right? It's a cool, you know. But here's the last one, church, that I want to give because this is more the practical part. So we see our God is a God that separates. He separates from good from evil, dark from light, the righteous from the unrighteous, the justified from the unjustified, the forgiven and those who are guilty. But the last separation that I want, because this has some practical application, and that is this, the sheep from the goat. <laughs> because the sheep from the goat is almost like that last parable about the end. This is how it goes. But when the son of man comes into his glory. So this is the end. And all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. So this is the end. The very end when Jesus comes to judge the nations. And he says very clearly there, he's going to start separating the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. So I began to find out, I tried to figure out, okay, what's, why did God use this parable? Because Jesus is, is, is just amazing when it comes to storytelling. And this parable, obviously, it must be something that people can understand, right? That's the purpose of parable. So it's... Maybe not for you and I because we don't, we're not shepherds. We don't live around sheep and goats. Most of us don't. But at that day, th there is. So I began to do some digging. What is the difference between sheep and goats? Now, let me tell you this. The, the sheep and goats is very easily distinguished in North America. Why? Because North America, the sheep are genetically modified to produce a lot of wool. So, you know, th the sheep is very thick of wool where goats have just hair. So it's very clear. But in Asia or in Africa, when they're not genetically modified, you can't tell the difference just by looking from a distance. They, do, they, they look very similar. So I want you to know that. Christians or non-Christians, physically, we look alike, right? We don't have a halo walking around around us, right? Look at these halo guys, you know. As a Christian, we don't. We look the same. We wear the same kind of clothes. We wear pants, shoes, whatever, cell phone. So outside we look alike, but when, it, when I start digging, the difference between sheep and goats is that the, the, the difference is in their personality or their character. So one is that sheep are more dependent and goats are more independent. In other words, sheep depend on the shepherd, where goats are more, they, they just want to do their own things. Doesn't that, that show us that God is our shepherd, Jesus is our shepherd, we're depending on him. But Ungodly people, you know, unbelievers, they just depend on themselves. I can do whatever I want to do. I depend on myself, on my money, my position, my looks, whatever it is. Another one is that sheep listens to the shepherd where goats do not. Right? And that's why Jesus said in John uh, 11, I think, he says that, uh, 10, that he says that, you know, my sheep hears my voice. 
So Christians, we need to hear God's voice. We need to be able to hear him, his Holy Spirit speaking to us. Where goats, they don't listen. Okay? And then the third one is that uh, sheep have gentle spirits where goats, they are very defiant, rebellious. Sheep follow the shepherd where a lot of times goats, uh, shepherd, whatever, you know, they follow the goats. Because goats go wherever they want to go. They don't listen. They're rebellious, they're stubborn, and they're defiant. And so when you look at that, that's what distinguishes us from unbelievers. We're dependent on God. We trust him. We have faith in him, in his words, his provision, his protection. We listen to his voice, and we want to have a gentle spirit. The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, right? Self-control. Where the, 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 the unbelievers, they're defiant, they're rebellious, they like to destroy things, they like to wreak rioting, they like to steal, they like to kill, they like to lie, they like to, again, hurt other people. But here's the last difference that I picked up, I thought it was neat, and that is sheep's milk is way more nutritious than goat's milk. This is what it says. I quote it for you. It says, sheep's milk contains almost twice the fat and the protein of goat's milk. Fat equals flavor. But the protein con content is important too. Goat milk is lower in casein and, pro and a protein that curdles so that it produces a more crumbly curd, while sheep's cheese is generally more co cohesive. Sheep cheese is also higher in carbs, vitamin C, vitamin B12, folate, calcium, magnesium, than goat cheese. The bottom line... Milk from sheep are more nutritious. It brings more health, life, a blessing to those who drink it. And I think that's what differentiates us too. As a believers, we want to be a blessing to the community. Hey, Mark, can I have that water, please? So if you read this, now you see why God separates the sheep from the goat. <coughs> but here's what God said to the sheep. He says to the one on the right, he says, The king said to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In other words, going to heaven with him. He's talking to the sheep. And he tells him why. Look what it says here. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you come to me. When you look at all the one in the yellow, it could be physical or spiritual. A person could be physically hungry and thirsty, or they could be spiritually hungry and thirsty. But the point is that we feed them. Okay? Are we doing that? Are we helping the, those who are hungry and thirsty, both physically or spiritually? Are we helping that? <coughs> so the same thing with um, a stranger or naked. The idea there is that you're a stranger, you're isolated, you're all alone, you're lonely. But you welcome them, you befriend them. Okay? Naked, that means you're feeling exposed. Okay? We're vulnerable. Are we protecting them? And, and the same thing with prison. It could be physical prison or it could be spiritual prison. Somebody who is you know, spiritually in bondage. And are we ministering to them? This is practical, church. Remember, this idea here is God separating the sheep from the goat. Okay, are you a sheep or are you a goat? And then in verse, <coughs> the king said, uh, because the people ask, is it God, how, how, when do we see you naked or thirsty or hungry? And look what Jesus said. The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Okay? So, so the idea here is that he, they're not performing. It was just natural to them to help 
the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the strangers, and the prison, imprisoned, both physical or spiritual. Are we doing that, church? Are you involved in ministries? Are you a blessing to others? Or are you self-focused about yourself, about my business, about my money, my cars, my house? It's all about me, 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 me. And that's the problem with the goats. Because when, he, when God said to the goats and said that you didn't do any of these things, the goats asked the same question. And then God answered them this way. Then he will answer to them, truly I say to you, <coughs> to the extent that you did not do it to one of these least, you did not do it to me. And these will, be, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So this is a very sobering message as I end. Our God is a God that separates. In the beginning, we look alike. Maybe some of us here sitting, we, I can't tell the difference. You all go to church, maybe you sing, you give, but there is a day that God is truly going to sh separate us. The sheep from the goat, the wheat from the tares, darkness from light. Remember what he says in Mark 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name, cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And what did Jesus say? He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, for you are practicing lawlessness. We don't want to be that church. So I want to encourage us as we close to be reminded again that our God is a God that separates. Yes, in creation, he's separating light from dark, waters from waters. But let's make an application here. He's going to separate us. If we are a faithful follower of Christ, and how do we know we are a faithful follower? Well, we will bear fruits. And God is talking about that earlier. When I was hungry, you feed me. When I'm thirsty, you give me water. When I'm a stranger, you welcome me. When I'm naked, you clothe me. When I'm in prison, you visit me. That's how we know that we're true believers. It's not a work thing. It's not about good, doing good works to get saved. We're doing good works because we have been saved. Because I'm saved, I want to do good works. Because the Spirit of God is in me. Remember the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Well, how do we do that? The second commandment. Love your neighbors yourself. And how do we do that? The third one. Go and make disciples. Are you making disciples? Are you loving your neighbors? Feeding them physical food or spiritual food? Are they thirsty? Maybe they, many of them are hungry and thirsty. So church, let's be real right now. <coughs> because I don't want us to come on that day and God said, I don't know you. But God, I sing on the stage here. Or God, I involved in this and that. Uh, but I don't know you. Because you're not doing the will of my Father in heaven. So let's pray, church. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. As always, I like to invite you to ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today through this message? If God comes today and he separates this, this room, the goats from the sheep, do you know for sure if you will be on this right? Do you know for sure if you'll be the sheep? Or you're still unsure? If you're unsure, then there's a way you can make to be sure. First and foremost is that we need to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. But if you've done that already, then it's time for us to, to mature, to get more involved, to stop focusing about ourself, our own needs, but begin to be a blessing. So let's take a moment right now. Let's talk to the Holy Spirit. Let's be sure.
If anyone here is unsure and you have not accepted Christ, let's just invite you right now to pray in your heart. Just tell God, God, I want to be sure today. Today I come to understand that there's a day that you will separate the righteous from the unrighteous, the believers from the unbelievers. Lord, I choose to believe today. I believe that I am a sinner, that I deserve to go to hell, but I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. Today, Lord, I choose to put my faith in Christ alone. Today, I choose to declare that you are my Lord and Savior. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Church, for many of us here, this could be something that is a, a, just simply a reminder. But for some of us, perhaps it's the first time you heard it, that God will actually separate us. In that time of separation, we cannot have any excuses like that guest who was speechless. During that separation time, it will not be about how many people likes you on Facebook or your Instagram, how many followers on your Twitter account. But the question is that are we fulfilling the will of God? Because that's the qualification that we just read earlier. So today I want to invite you. Let us be a true follower of Christ. And let's not play church. If that's your desire, let's all stand together. Let's stand together as I close in prayer. Father God, I just want to thank you right now for this message. I know it's not easy, but God, I believe that is the best way we can love, and that is to tell the truth. And Father, I share this truth according to your prompting about the separation. So I pray, God, as we walk from this place, not discouraged, but encouraged and warned that you're prompting us, God. You're giving us a second chance. That you want us to be a true follower of Christ. Because there's a day and a time where you will truly separate the sheep from the goat. Help us, Lord, to be sheep. To be dependent upon you. To hear and abide your voice. And to have a gentle spirit. And to be a blessing to those around us. So thank you, Lord, for your words. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being our creator that loves us. So that we know that we have a purpose in this world. And so, Father, as we go from this place, I ask God that you bless us. Thank you for an extra day of rest tomorrow. That we can spend time with each other, with our families, or being a blessing to those who are in need. Thank you, Lord. So church, go now. Go with the peace of Christ. Go with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit from this day onward. And especially know that God loves you. And he wants to have that intimacy with you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time,
I don't know how you make your way, but I 